to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win.
welcome to the report from Iron Mountain. This report is something you would never believe unless you read it. But you also have to understand the mindset of the government that requested it. And that is one of the most important features of this video. The objective was to determine accurately and realistically the nature of the problems that would confront the United States if and when a condition of permanent peace should arrive. This is one of the key elements of the report because we are to go under, under the Antichrist system, an era of supposed peace. And this is what this whole program was about. If and when a condition of permanent peace should arise, that means that peace in reality equals world socialism as we will find out as we journey through this report. And they were to draft a program for dealing with this contingency. In other words, this is a planned situation. The program equals the agenda. And how do we control the people of America if we move to an era of peace? And not only just America, but the, uh, the whole world at large. In 1961, Public Law 87-297 was passed, paving the way for the United States to be merged with the United Nations. It's a very crucial law in that it disarms the American citizen in violation of the clear intent of the Constitution, which calls for our right to bear arms to maintain our free state. And by the calling for the disarming of all Americans, of course, we lose our free state and we are submerged actually into a slave state. Uh, the disarming was to be done by a period of gradual disarmament and as they were disarming the United Nations would be built up with a powerful standing army. The evidence suggests a CFR TC Bilderberg connection the rich men of the earth, the merchants of Babylon, the killers of the just according to the Holy Scriptures. concerns itself with a globalist agenda and the conclusions reached have been advanced by these groups. Every one of the conclusions in, uh, in the Iron Mountain report have been advanced by these groups, Committee of 300, the CFR, TC, Bilderbergers, Royal Institute for International Affairs, Tavistock, your Club of Rome, United Nations, it goes on and on. Okay, it began back in 1950, actually. These hearings uh, began to take place in the United States, and the calls for a world government were actually held in 1950. Here's a resolution uh, in Congress that was considered and called for testimony, and it says to provide a true world government through the adoption of a world government constitution. It was a clear intent to place uh, the United States directly under the United Nations and to scrap our Constitution. Universal peace is a prerequisite for the pursuit of that goal, and from the competitive anarchy of nationals, or nation states, therefore the age of nations must end, and the era of humanity must begin. You will find there's a constant call for the merging of all humanity. Here's a resolution uh, adopted in the United Nations. This is what it says, regulation, limitation, and balanced reduction of all armed forces and all armaments. The all armaments means your weapons that you have in your closet for your own defense. 
It includes handguns and rifles and all kinds of things. Here's your blueprint for world peace, which was issued also in 1961 uh, concurrently as this move uh, towards putting us under the United Nations. You'll find that as the United Nation or United States and the R Russian military are to be reduced, the UN is consistently brought up to a higher and higher position. The only thing we are left with are internal security forces. Under the Freedom From War, this is a packet issued by the uh, federal government to go along with uh, 87 to 97. This can only be achieved, the merging and disarmament, through the progressive strengthening of international institutions under the United Nations and by creating a United Nations Peace Force. See, they want to progressively strengthen the international institutions, all of which come under the United Nations. We are to lose our sovereignty. This can only be achieved through the progressive strengthening. By creating a United Nations peace, which really means police force, to enforce the peace. This is what Daniel said, and by peace the Antichrist shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. All right, back to the government report. The disbanding of all national armed forces and the prohibition of their reestablishment in any form whatsoever other than those required to preserve internal order and for contributions to a United Nations peace force. They are to bring the UN up to a point where no state should, would have the military power to challenge the progressively strengthened U.S. police uh, peace force, and all international disputes would be settled according to the agreed principles of international conduct. That's exactly what the Bible says. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. No one can make war with this final world entity. And if you will study your scriptures out, you will find that the United Nations fulfills every parameter listed for the uh, Antichrist system. And Public Law 87297 has been updated. There are numerous updates. You will, if you go search them out, uh, Public Law 101-216, for example, has been updated. Here's another one. I have today signed H.R. 1495, the Arms Control and Disarmament Amendment Acts of nine, uh, 1989. Uh, it authorizes the uh, fiscal appropriations uh, to get this thing underway. Now, the problem with it is the Bill of Rights and Amendment 2, the right to bear arms, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. In other words, in reality, you cannot infringe that right in any way, method, or manner. The only way a people can remain free is to hold in their power the weapons necessary to secure their free state. This amendment deals with the international security of the United States from its own government. In other words, this amendment was to secure the people's freedom from their own government, from an internal government takeover. This right is not there uh, so that you can go hunting or for the other excuses made. It is there to prevent the government of the United States from becoming a dictatorship by treason. In other words, by betrayal of the Constitution of the United States. Now, in order to merge the United States into the United Nations requires a total betrayal of the Constitution, which guarantees you a free state through the right to bear arms. Do you see the connection? The United Nations is a communist, illuminist, Masonic world dictatorship, and there are no freedoms, hence they have to get the guns to eliminate the free state nation guarantee in our Constitution. 
The Iron Mountain Report, then, is a report in reality on how to circumvent the Constitution of the United States. And in reality, it's a document of treason, uh, of how the rich men of the earth are actually going to divert the attentions of the people away so that they can get this done. The guidelines given by the government for the Iron Mountain Report, one, military-style objectivity, Two, avoidance of any value assumptions. And three, the inclusion of all relevant data. And this is a very important part of this report, is the avoidance of all value assumptions. This is what makes it so absolutely cold and inhuman. It is to be a moral. It is as a computer is a moral. It deals in factual data. There is not any mercy. There is not any compassion. It doesn't deal in right or wrong or what is good or evil. It is a report on the handling of men, women, children, and babies on the basis of herd or animal management without regard to any moral considerations whatsoever. It reduces people to objects. It reduces all humans to non-entities with no rights of self-determination, with no rights granted by the Creator, and with absolutely no rights under a Constitution. The Constitution has been effectively canceled by Iron Mountain. Now again, you'll find these resolutions coming up in Congress all the time that want to strengthen the United Nations uh, to establish an international criminal court SJ-32. Uh, These are bills uh, before the Congress and the Senate. Uh, the implementation of Agenda 21 and other Earth su Summit agreements, which is all United Nations. Reagan called for the uh, uh, World Army. Uh, there is. Uh, Clinton has approved a UN Army. You're seeing it on TV all the time. War is required the glue of the nations, according to the Iron Mountain Report. Is war the scourge of the nations? It is said that war is merely an extension of diplomacy by other means. It is also said that war is necessary waste. But what is war? And why do peoples of the earth continuously fight and die? Why do millions of human families have a member or members that they have lost to this thing called war? What is the reality behind war? Does man have to fight wars, or can he develop a system of peace? And would the development of peace be worse than war itself? The Bible gives us some answers. The rest can be supplied by simple logic and deduction. James tells us that from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and ye cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because you ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. The root of war, then, is lust, and lust is want, and want is greed, and the root of greed is a self-centered heart, an unregenerated human heart. This is the key we need to explain war, and the Bible gives us many clues to why warfare is, and that in reality it can never be stopped. The root of the problem lies with the human heart, and the Bible says that the human heart is so desperately wicked that none can know it. Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Paul says in Romans, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the laws of God, neither indeed can be. Jesus was very emphatic that out of the heart of man poured forth all kinds of evil. The problem with mankind is then his evil heart, evil because it is self-centered and evil because it does not contain true love. The love within that it does have is hurtful or harmful, manipulative, self-centered, and filled with its own desires, according to the Lord. But 
we obtain other clues as well from the scriptures as to the true reasons for war, and particularly in our day and age. Jesus, uh, rather James says, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for the miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped together treasure for the last days. Ye have killed and condemned the just. Now let's run a little logic. Lust is the center of war. Lust is greed, and greed is from evil, self-centered hearts. The Bible also says that the love of money is the root of all evil, or the height of all greeds. Lust then is greed, and the ultimate greed is an insane love of money, which brings with it power, which brings with it control over mankind. Thus the rich men of the earth are indeed in total control over money, and they have developed a system of economic controls well laid out in the scriptures. If the rich men of the earth gain control over the planet via their Babylonian economic system, then they are the ones who are only powerful enough and rich enough to wage war, and they are the only ones who can develop the war machines that you are looking at on your television screen. They are the ones who can develop the weapons necessary for modern warfare. Iron Mountain agrees. The very title confirms the Bible. The title says that it is a report on the desirability and feasibility for peace. It was ordered by the rich men of the earth. Therefore, they themselves must be the ones waging the wars, and now they have elected not to wage wars, but have elected uh, to do something else because warfare is drawing to a close, it will have soon served its purpose. In other words, it is a deliberate effort to bring in another system, for the first system of war has almost accomplished the goals originally intended. Albert Pike was purported to have written a letter in which he outlines three world wars. Each had a specific purpose and each had a goal. The last war, World War III, was to be fought to bring in an era of peace under Lucifer. It was to be fought predominantly uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it would come in an era of seeming peace when it seemed like everything was fine, everything was great. The Bible says that the Antichrist is a man of peace. He rides a white horse and has no war machine. There are no arrows in his bow. He is to usher in a period of peace after great wars. Iron Mountain is about this era of peace. Iron Mountain is a report to aid Antichrist in his rise to power. It is in reality a report from hell. Iron Mountain asks, what can be expected if peace comes? What should we be prepared to do about it? What, for instance, are the real functions of war in modern societies? Th these are very important questions. The Soviet Union says the peaceful exploration of outer space is the constructive alternative to the plans uh, aimed at spreading the arms race. In other words, we are always going to find that the opposite of war is peace, which of course it is in reality, but what Iron Mountain is getting at is what are the real functions of warfare, the invisible functions of warfare? What role do they play in the overall structure of human society? For example, the Soviet Union has been on a war fitting for years and years. We have, to a lesser extent, in America been on a war footing. Uh, it's been predominantly a, a cold war for, for many, many years, but nonetheless, it has been, and uh, as far as the economics of it are concerned, it has been a war era. It's been an age of war. And what this report is asking about is what about peace? It is surely no exaggeration to say that conditions of world peace would lead to changes in the social structure of the nations. These changes would be of unparalleled and revolutionary magnitude. As
as we would transition then from an era of war into peace, what would be the problems? It is an incorrect assumption that war as an institution is subordinate to the social system it is believed to serve. What they're saying here is that nations wage war for reasons other than what they state. War itself is the basic social system within which others are secondary modes of organization, conflict, or conspire. In other words, war itself is the basic social system of mankind. And if we go to peace, we're going to have problems unless we understand that. It is the system which has governed most human societies on record today. Well, this is, of course, very true in our day and age. We have seen nothing but war, starting uh, predominantly with World War I and coming forward. Uh, the Soviet Union has uh, had tremendous expenditures in their military, and the United States has likewise. It's been, in reality, an arms race. Uh, we're going to find out there is a reason for it. The capacity of a nation to make war is the greatest social power it can exercise. War making, active or contemplated, is a matter of life and death, says Iron Mountain. The misconceptions of war, one, to defend a military, or in, uh, defend a nation rather, from military attack by another, or to deter such attack to defend the national interest, economic, political, or ideological. To maintain or increase a nation's military power for its own sake. Now you see, these are the visible or more obvious reasons why a person would say, well, that's why we have war. But what they're saying is there are more, less obvious, very invisible reasons for why nations have war. And this is the heart of the entire Iron Mountain report. Its conclusion was that war is absolutely necessary. It's an absolute requirement for human societies and nations to come together it is in reality, they claim, the glue of the nation. The so Soviet military machine, or its war-making capacity, is the actual glue that has held the Soviet Union and the Communist Empire together. If they were to move into an era of peace, what would happen? All right, Iron Mountain says it is these invisible or implied functions that are the dominant forces in our society. So what we have to find out then is what are the true functions of war in a society? Why, for example, has the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, both of which are controlled by the rich men of the earth, been on a constant war footing, constantly escalating this conflict? Why are they doing it and what are the reasons behind it? Economic reasons are it is a necessary waste that operates outside the normal economic supply and demand system. Warfare creates an artificial demand. In other words, the war system itself, having huge militaries with all of their armaments, with all of the research and developments, creates a demand. This waste of money outside the system, according to Iron Mountain, acts as a counterbalance to the economic uh, growth of the nation. It is progressive for research and development of weapon systems, and it spurs technological advances which spin off and help society at large. Defense spending, per se, might be countenanced on economic grounds alone as a stimulator of the national metabolism. In other words, war itself, for economic purposes, is a tremendous growth factor. For the political reasons, it's different. A nation is a group of people organized together with a common goal and a national identity. The nation has an outlook or an attitude of how it will deal with other nations, and that's what we call foreign policy. A nation's foreign policy, says Iron Mountain, can have no substitute 
if it lacks, or no substance rather, if it lacks the means of enforcing its attitude. In other words, if the nation is not strong enough, it doesn't matter what their attitude towards somebody else is. War is itself the defining element of any nation's existence vis-a-vis -vis any other nation. War then equals nations because it is the glue of nations and what causes them to come together and peace would mean the dissolving of the nations. The elimination of war implies the elimination of national sovereignty and the traditional nation state. Please understand the importance of that remark in Iron Mountain. It is the elimination of war that brings us to world government. The war system not only has been essential to the existence of nations as independent political entities, but has been equally indispensable to their stable internal development. Without it, the war system, no government has ever been able to obtain its legitimacy, or in other words, we could say its right to rule its society. War is the basis of that claim to rule, and it is therefore the glue that holds a nation together, according to Iron Mountain. The possibility of war provides a sense of external necessity without which no government can remain in power. The organization of a society for the possibility of war is its principal political stabilizer. All right, in other words, for the Soviet Union, they said that the American people were the enemy. And that gave them the glue which held the Soviet Empire together, which rallied the people to make such sacrifices so that we could build up this huge war machine. The basic authority of the modern state over its people resides in its war powers. Now that's another very important statement. Therefore, a substitute for the war system must be found in order to control the people and provide stability and legitimacy of government if we go into an era of peace. Now we know that the United Nations is to be that era of peace. So therefore, what they are saying is we have to find substitutes for what war does, the invisible functions of war. We have to find a substitute for that if we are going to go to peace. Obviously, if the war machine is discarded, new political machinery would be needed at once. In other words, as they phase war out, they have to phase whatever they're going to put in its place in to control the people to control the nation. This is an essential part of Iron Mountain. Until it, the substitute for war, is developed, the continuance of the war system must be assured to maintain the stability of its internal organization of power. In other words, we have to keep the war system going in order to remain in control keep war until all substitutes are in place and running so we don't ru lose our rulership. In other words, those that are in power are going to remain in power. They've got to figure out a way to do that. So they're going to de-escalate the war system as they bring in a peace system. And the peace system is going to radically alter our societies. What substitutes for war are there? Well, it has to be a universal threat of equal magnitude as that of World War. The immediate loss of life and the immediate thought that blood is going to be shed. It has to be credible and it must be accepted by the vast majority of the population of any given nation or in reality the whole world if they're going to bring in global peace. Credibility in fact, says Iron Mountain, lies at the heart of the problem of developing a political substitute 
for war. We must emphasize that one must be found of credible quality and magnitude if a transition to peace is to ever come about without social disintegration. In other words, really what they're saying is a nation would self-destruct without an external threat of some type. It is more probable in our judgment that such a threat will have to be invented rather than developed from some unknown conditions. That means exactly what it says. They're going to invent a system to accomplish this. political substitute for war would require alternate enemies. In other words, we have to find an external threat that's uh, essentially very large. It may be, for instance, that gross pollution of the environment can eventually replace the possibility of mass destruction by nuclear weapons as the principal threat to the survival of the species. In other words, they're going to bring the environment up to a point of global threat. Poisoning of the air and of the principal sources of food and water supply is already well advanced and at first glance would seem promising in this respect. It constitutes a threat that can be dealt with only through social organization and political power. But from present indications, it will be a generation to a generation and a half before environmental pollution will be sufficiently menacing on a global scale to offer a solution as a substitute for war. In other words, we replace the war threat with an environmental threat. Now you know why the environment is on the TVs and the media constantly. A generation to, is about 30 years, so it would be about 1991 that this would be brought up to a global scale. It is true that the rate of pollution could be increased selectively for this purpose. In other words, selectively find areas where you could deliberately increase the pollution to get this threat in motion a little quicker. It is true that the rate of pollution could be increased selectively. In fact, the mere modification of existing programs for the deterrence of pollution could speed up the process enough to make the threat credible much sooner. In other words, let's have the governments drag their feet on pollution controls or the enforcement of pollution controls. And around the world, that's exactly what we have seen, a matter of foot dragging on the areas. One would then perhaps get the concept that this was all deliberate. Allow pollution to deliberately get worse until it can be manipulated by the controlled media into a world crisis. A global crisis has to be developed. Al Gore, Vice President, very timely book perhaps coincidentally. He wrote the book called Earth in the Balance, Ecology and a Human Spirit. It's a modern version of Iron Mountain in the ecological field. And, and in reality, it's quite an interesting book. You, you should go out and buy a copy of it. Uh, the world uh, government organizations are pushing this climate crisis, emergency Earth Rescue Administration, the people of the earth have a new common en enemy which requires an emergency worldwide campaign. You see, and we have to abandon our armaments to join in a common cause for survival. What did Iron Mountain say? It had to be a threat to the survival of the species.
1960s, when Apollo missions were bound for the moon, that we were first able to see complete pictures of the Earth. Environmentalists began to look at our planet as a single, fragile ecosystem. Now we are intensely studying the thin halo of atmosphere that surrounds and protects Earth. It recycles the air we breathe, regulates climate, and acts as a protective barrier, filtering out much of the sun's harmful radiation. Last year, an international group of scientists proved that ozone, the key element in this filtering process, is being lost at an alarming rate over the South Pole. In fact, a sizable hole develops over this area each winter. Without ozone, the sun's harmful radiation will destroy life on Earth. A group of man-made compounds called chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, used as refrigerants, cleaning solvents, and in some plastic foams, are to blame for this environmental problem. They eventually make their way into the atmosphere and destroy ozone. According to Dr. Brian Toon of NASA's Ames Research Center, it is a global scale environmental problem. This really marks the first time uh, in the history of environmental science where human beings on one side of the planet have done something to the planet that has significantly affected it globally and on, on the far side of the planet from where the original pollution took place. Using the beautiful seaport town of Stavanger, Norway as a base of operations, an international team of scientists assembled this year in an emergency effort to make a detailed study of the North Pole. Most of the work was performed aboard two NASA aircraft. This is the ER-2. For the mission, special wing pods are attached containing atmospheric chemistry analysis equipment and a host of other instruments. Typically, flights are made about 12 miles up, along the fringes of space, right into the layers of atmosphere directly affected by ozone loss. The ER-2's research partner is a modified DC-8. It flies at lower altitudes, but has increased fuel reserves, which allow it to cover more territory, even flights directly over the North Pole. Inside, the DC-8 is actually a complete scientific observatory, loaded with sensing instruments. Scientists perform their... ...experiments and are able to map results right on the spot. This instrument contains four lasers capable of shooting light many miles up into the atmosphere. The light reflects back to the plane and provides scientists with a cross-sectional map of ozone concentrations as well as aerosols, or regions where ozone depletion is capable of occurring. Initial results from both aircraft indicate that high concentrations of CFCs have been found at northern latitudes, primed for ozone destruction. When combined with high-altitude ice clouds, the right amount of sunlight and confined slow-moving masses of air, ozone destruction occurs. As a result of this airborne mission, scientists were able to confirm the process and predict areas of depletion. International policymakers have met in hopes of limiting the amount of CFC production and recently agreed to phase out its use by the year 2000. Many scientists worry that this may not be soon enough. Again, Dr. Toon. With the ozone problem, for example, when you release chlorofluorocarbons to the environment, it's decades to centuries before those are removed. Researching safe economic replacements for CFCs is a vital part of solving this serious environmental issue. Thanks to the intensive work done in the last few years, we know why ozone depletion exists. It is now up to the world community to take responsibility for the future of our global environment. critical stage. It has never been more important that we understand the environmental relationships of our planet. 
scientists are striving to apply the technology of the space age, the quest for more and better information about these complex relationships. In 1972, a new kind of satellite left the launch pad and rose to an altitude of 910 kilometers from Earth. There, it settled in a circular orbit around the planet. This satellite, called Landsat, opened a new era of Earth resource management. One substitute for war has then been found. The Iron Mountain agenda is being carried out. The objectives of the EcoScan? Well, the UN will end up with control over all the land, and ownership of the land will be held by the rich men. There is arising a crisis of worldwide proportions involving developed and developing countries alike, the crisis of the human environment. The process of compromise of national interests will, of course, have to take place. International economic security is inconceivable unless related not only to the world's environment, but also to the elimination of the threat to the world's environment. Well, the only major threat is private property ownership and private property rights where people can do as they want. Let us also think about setting up within the framework of the United Nations a Center for Emergency Environmental Assistance. You can see how they're raising this thing up to an emergency status, an emergency le level. And that's what Mikhail Gorbachev said in December 8, 1989, in a speech to the United Nations. The United Nations will be the controller of all the lands in the world through their various ecological, environmental uh, organizations that they are in the process of setting up. In fact, the Rio Earth Summit was for that specific reason. Now, it's owned by the rich men. That's who owns the United Nations. That's who actually runs it. Eco Foundations of the World Wildlife Fund, Heritage Trust, Nature Conser Conservancy, etc. Uh, there's a lot of them, and you have many UN organizations. And the rich men of the earth sit on the boards of directors on all of these groups. These groups are buying up huge chunks of private land for conservation, they say, and to preserve the earth. And of course, all of it is to be owned by the rich men. And what they cannot purchase by normal means will be taken under zoning controls, DNR regulations, or other land grab means via governmental authority and regulation. All land will be under strict eco-controls because, after all, we are now involved in, in the middle of an eco-emergency, and it's nothing but a scam. It's really a debt for land swamp is another part of it. The international bankers loan and control the monies to all the countries and, through interest, have driven them into huge debt status. The debt of the United States is in the trillions. The bankers then come forward with a new plan. They will take the nation's land, and then they will cancel the debt of that nation. It is called a debt for land swap. This land will be held by a world conservation bank, owned, of course, by the rich men of the earth. They will then own all the land, all the resources, all the food. They become the absolute masters, and all the people become the slaves. It's a perfect scam. It's a perfect system. Because the eco-threat is now global, then obviously it can only be controlled by a global authority. And guess who that is? Why, of course, it's the United Nations. Now, the eco-scam is being pushed by every organization that's involved in the environment. Uh, even Time magazine ran an article on the endangered earth. It's being put in all your children's uh, school books, all of their study books.
crowding of human life, about how we have such an ecological crisis, an environmental crisis, and unless we all do our share, why the whole world is just going to disintegrate and the entire population of man will be eliminated. That's according to them. It's very interesting that Daniel said of the Antichrist that he shall divide the land for gain. In other words, he takes over all the land and divides it up amongst these various foundation groups. And that's exactly what's happening.
It has been hotly argued that such a menace would offer the last best hope for peace by uniting mankind against the danger of destruction by creatures from other planets or from outer space. Experiments have been proposed to test the credibility of an out-of-the-world invasion threat. It is possible that a few of the more difficult to explain flying saucer incidents are of this nature. The thrust of the second threat is to unite mankind against a common enemy. The escalation of the UFO mystery requires careful media control. The threat must also dovetail into the agenda for a one world government. Everything that Iron Mountain proposes in all of their substitutes will lead into a one world government. We really want to understand what's going on in space today and what's happening with the plan to put weapons in space. I think it's instructive to go back and understand the origins of the US space program. And to do that, you have to go back to Nazi Germany. Hitler recruited a brilliant young rocket scientist by the name of Werner von Braun, who had a weekend rocket club, to come to work for the Nazis to build the V1 and V2 rockets that were used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels towards the end of World War II. And for von Braun and his team, uh, they set up along the Baltic Sea a place called Pinamunde. It was a research and development center for the Nazi rocket uh, operation. And to this place at Pinamunde, the Nazis brought thousands of Jews and French resistance fighters to serve as prisoners, essentially slaves, to build this production effort. Well, the British found out about it, went in and bombed the entire operation. And so the Nazis said, we've got to move to a more secure location. And down inside of central Germany, there's a mountain chain called the Hartz Mountains. And in that mountain, there's a huge tunnel where the Nazis were storing military hardware. Well, they cleared the whole thing out, moved the entire rocket operation into the tunnel, named it Middlework. And just outside the mountain tunnel at Middlework, the Nazis built a brand new concentration camp called Dora. And to Dora, the Nazis brought 40,000 Jews, gypsies, French resistance fighters, homosexuals, communists, even a black American GI were brought there to serve as slaves for the operation. Well, you know, immediately after the war, the U.S. and the Allies created the Nuremberg Trials, at which time we brought the Nazis to justice for their crimes against humanity. But 1,500 of the top Nazis never went to trial. They were smuggled into the United States by the U.S. military in, uh, under a program called Operation Paperclip, smuggled in through Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. And Werner von Braun and his rocket team, a hundred of them, along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket, were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, where von Braun became the first director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's interesting is the other 1,400 Nazis, who were they? Well, some of them were brought to the United States to work for the CIA. Others were brought to the United States to do the LSD drug experiments and the MK Ultra Mind experiments during the 1960s where people were jump, jumping out of windows. Some of the uh, Nazi scientists that in Germany had been taking Jews and putting them in freezing temperatures to see how the body would react to that were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and were put in charge of the U.S. military flight medicine program. And so when you uh, take 1,500 of the top Nazi scientists and essentially seed the military-industrial complex. The question I have is, do they bring with them an ideological contamination? Well, not only did von Braun go to work for NASA, but the guy that was in charge of the V-2 flight test program up at Pinamundi along the Baltic Sea, a guy by the name of Kurt Diebus, became the first director of the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And then the man that recruited von Braun, Major General Walter Dornberger, the guy that was sent by uh, Hitler to recruit von Braun to come to work for the Nazis, 
He became vice president of Bell Aerosystems Corporation in New York that made its riches building the helicopters for the war in Vietnam. In fact, in 1958, Dornberger testified before the United States Congress saying that America's top space priority should be to, quote, conquer, occupy, keep, and utilize space between the Earth and the Moon. And in fact, later on in a speech before a National Missile Industry Conference, Dornberger told the assembled, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the Third World War. I lost two already. And then finally, the man that was in charge of production and middlework inside the mountain tunnel there in Germany, Arthur Rudolph, he became the first project director of the NASA Saturn V rocket program that took the United States to the moon. And so these are the essential origins of the U.S. space program. And the Space Command put out a planning document a few years ago called Vision for 2020. And on the cover of it, you see a satellite hitting targets on the Earth below. Let's take a look at some of the language in this so-called vision for 2020. The Space Command says that in the future, because of corporate globalization of the world economy, they expect that there's going to be a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots, between the rich and the poor all over the world. And as a result of that, the Pentagon predicts that there's going to be more and more regional instability around the world because people that are under the boot of these multinational corporations are going to organize. They're going to try to organize unions. They're going to organize to get uh, these corporations from controlling their governments. And the Pentagon says, you know, we can't put a Marine on every single street corner of the world to suppress these populations. But with space technology in place, we'll be able to see everything, hear everything, and essentially target everything in every place on the Earth. And the Vision 2020 says that space superiority will emerge as an essential element of battlefield success in future warfare.